In this lesson, we are going to talk about elementary matrices and its relationship to the inverse of a matrix. Recall that in the last lesson, we were able to find the formula for the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix. What we want to do in this lesson is to find an algorithm in solving for the inverse of an invertible matrix. We will discuss elementary matrices and it will turn out that this elementary matrices can be used to compute the inverse of a matrix. Let us first define the meaning of elementary matrices. An elementary matrix is one that is obtained by performing a single elementary row operation on the identity matrix. For example, we have here E1. E1 here was obtained from identity by replacement. We replaced R3 by adding the original row 3 of the identity and adding it with 5 times row 1. Here in E2, this was obtained from the identity by swapping. Here we swapped rows 1 and 2. And for E3, this was obtained from the identity by scaling. We multiplied row 1 by 2. Suppose we have this 3 by 3 matrix over here. We want to find the effect of multiplying an elementary matrix on the left. When we multiply the first row with the first column, we get A. First row times second column, we will only hit B. And similarly, for the third column, we hit C. Because of this one over here and the rest are zero, you will always hit the end least on the first row. Similarly, when you multiply the second row with each of your columns here, because of your one here on the second entry, you will always hit the entries in your second row. We have B, E, and F. For the third row, let's multiply the third row times the first column. We get 5A plus G, 5B plus H, and 5C plus I. What can you observe about this matrix? This matrix E1A here can be obtained from A by adding row 3 with 5 times row 1. That would be your new R3. Take note also that this row operation here is the same operation that you perform on the identity matrix to get your elementary matrix E1. Let us now see what happens if we multiply the matrix on the left by E2. First row times your first column, we will hit the second entry because of your 1 here. You will get D, E, F, and then for the second row, because of your 1 here, you will always hit the entries on the first row. And for the third row, when you multiply it with your columns, you will hit G, H, and I. So as you can notice here, from E to E to A, you can obtain E to A by swapping rows 1 and 2. And again, take note that swapping row 1 and row 2 is the operation that we performed on the identity matrix to get our elementary matrix E2. When we multiply E3 on the left of A, what do we get? For the first row, we will always hit the first rows multiplied by 2. We get 2A 2B, 2C, 
this will still be D E F G H I T e to E three A. You can obtain this by multiplying row two one by row and this this operation here is the same operation that we performed on the identity matrix to get your elementary matrix E three. Here is a theorem that generalizes the result that we had earlier. If an elementary row operation is performed on a matrix A, the result is EA where E is the elementary matrix obtained by performing the same operation on the identity matrix. What this is saying is, for example, we have your matrix here. This is A and then you perform some operations, some operation here. And this matrix that you obtain here, this matrix that you obtain here is simply the matrix A multiplied by the elementary matrix, where this elementary matrix is the matrix obtained from the identity by performing this same operation on the identity. Let us go back again to our elementary matrix E1. E1 is the matrix obtained from I by replacing row 3 with row 3 plus 5 times row 1. We want to undo this operation to get the identity matrix. What do I mean by that? Remember that we started with the identity matrix. And then we performed this row operation on the identity matrix to get E1. What operation must we perform here in order to get the identity matrix? From here to here, what do we need to do? We have to, we want to get rid of the 5 over here. So what will you do? What row and what row are we going to use? We want to use row 1. Correct? So we have, we multiply negative 5 row 1, then we add it with row 3. That will be your new R3. Again, take note that this is E1. What is the elementary matrix associated with this row operation? We replace row 3 by r3 minus 5r1 so that is this is 1 0 0 0 1 0 we have negative 5 0 1 this is the matrix obtained from the identity matrix by performing this row operation here let's call this f Take note that from our previous theorem, when we apply this row operation on E1, what is the matrix that we will get? It's the same as multiplying this elementary matrix with your matrix over here. And from here, it's equal to the identity. What is this saying? Take note, we have the matrix F times the matrix E1 is equal to the identity matrix. What is that saying? This is saying that F is the inverse of E1. Look at the form of the inverse of E1 with E1. We still have the same except that this time around instead of 5, we get negative 5. We will go back to this one later. Similarly, if we have E2 over here, this was obtained by swapping rows 1 and 2. How will we undo E2? What will we do? We have to swap rows 1 and 2 again. When we swap rows 1 and 2, we get the identity back. 
here we had rows 1 and 2, interchange rows 1 and 2. This is the identity. When we apply this row operation, this is E2 times the identity. But then again, when we perform this row operation, that's the same as multiplying this again by E2. And what do we have here? Let me just write it here. E2 times E2 is equal to the identity matrix, meaning to say the inverse of E2 is itself. Next, let's look at E3. E3 was obtained from the identity by scaling R1. We multiplied it by 2. We multiplied 2 to first row. That's our new row 1. How will we get the identity? From here, we now multiply this by 1 half. That would be our new row 1. What is the elementary matrix associated with this row operation? We perform this on the identity matrix. So we get 1 half, 0, 0. Let's call this... G. This is our I from our theorem performing this on the identity matrix. That is E3 times I. And then when we perform this to this matrix, the elementary matrix corresponding to this is G. So this matrix is G times E3. We have G times E3 is equal to the identity, which means that G is the inverse of E3. Because when you multiply G and E3, you got the identity. In general, any elementary matrix is invertible. And its inverse is also an elementary matrix of the same type. So if the elementary matrix is of swapping type wherein you interchange rows P and Q, the inverse operation is again you interchange rows P and Q. If you multiplied a row by K, the inverse of that is multiplying the row by 1 over K, assuming that K is not equal to 0, of course. And if it is replacement, if you add K times row P to row Q, you now subtract k times row p from row q. So for example, this elementary matrix here is replacement, correct? We obtain that from the identity matrix by adding row 3 with negative 2 or 2, correct? What would be the inverse of that? You will simply... Turn this to positive to 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 2, 1. Because to undo this operation, you have to add positive 2, R2, 2, to R3. Next, for B, B inverse was obtained from the identity matrix by scaling. So therefore, Instead of negative 4, we will just get its reciprocal. We have negative 1 fourth. Lastly, for C, this is swapping. We swap rows 3 and 1. So therefore, its inverse is just itself. Now, this theorem here tells us the conditions that must be satisfied for a matrix to be invertible. This theorem actually states two things. First is that 
A matrix is invertible if and only if it is row equivalent to the identity matrix. Take note that the identity matrix is in reduced row echelon forms. So therefore, we can also say that A is invertible if and only if its reduced row echelon form is the identity matrix. Another thing that this theorem is saying is that any sequence of row operations that reduces the matrix to the identity will also transform the identity into the inverse of A. In other words, if we keep track of all the steps that we perform to reduce A to the identity matrix, when we perform all of those operations, those same sequence of operation to the identity matrix, it will give us the inverse of A. Let us prove this. Suppose that A is invertible. We want to show that A is equivalent, a row equivalent to the identity matrix. If A is invertible, then AX equals B has exactly one solution for every B. We've seen this in our last lesson in particular what is that solution that's equal to a inverse b right we will not be needing that i just wanted to recall that if this one has exactly one solution that means that a has no free variables if a has no free variables that is saying that a has a pivot in every column but a is a square matrix. So therefore, if you have a pivot in every column, A also has a pivot in every row. So therefore, how will now your A look like? It has a pivot in every row and it has a pivot in every column. This is saying that its reduced row echelon form would now become the identity matrix. Hence, the reduced row echelon form of A is the identity matrix. Let's prove the other direction. Suppose that A is row equivalent to the identity matrix. We want to show that A is invertible. Suppose that E1, E2 up to EN are the elementary matrices corresponding to the row operations that transform A into EN. That means that we have A and then we multiply E1 on the left because that is the first row operation that we performed. The second row operation that we performed would be corresponding to the elementary matrix E2. So we multiply that on E1 times E and so on. So you keep on multiplying that until you reach the last operation. So you get this one. If I group this matrices over here, EN times EN minus 1 and so on up to E1 times E, that would give us the identity matrix. Therefore, this is now your A inverse. So as you can see there, A inverse is the product of E1, E2 up to EN over here. So from here, we can see that the inverse of A can be written as a product of elementary matrices. Let me write it here. If A inverse is EN, EN minus 1 up to E1, what is now A? A is the inverse of its inverse. Let me get the inverse. Recall that how do you get the inverse of a product? It's equal to the product of the inverses in reversed order. So this is E1 inverse, E2 inverse, and so on. EN minus 1 inverse, EN inverse. But take note that the inverse of an elementary matrix is again another elementary matrix. So we have seen here that A can be written as a product of elementary matrices.
Well, actually, you don't need this to prove that A is invertible. We already had that conclusion when we wrote that A inverse is this one. Here is the theorem which summarizes what I've just said earlier. A matrix is invertible if and only if it can be written as a product of elementary matrices. How do we find the inverse of A? Recall that in the previous theorem, I said that any sequence of row operations that reduces the matrix A to the identity matrix will also transform the identity matrix into its inverse. In order to keep track of the row operations that you perform from here to here, you can do that in a single step. All you have to do is to augment the identity matrix with A. And then you will now row reduce A and you want to get the identity matrix. And then in the end, whatever you get here, this will now be your inverse. Let me illustrate that by an example. We have a matrix A here. Let us compute the inverse of A. And upon doing that, we can also express A and the inverse of A as products of elementary matrices. The first thing that we need to do is to form this augmented matrix. Augment the identity matrix with your A. And then we will just perform row operations to get the identity matrix over here. Okay, so first I will interchange rows 1 and 2. Next, I will zero out these entries. Then I want to make this one. I will multiply row two by negative 1. Our leading entries are now 1, 1. So I want to make this 0. We do that by adding row 2 and row 3 and replace that to R3. We'll now turn this into 1 by multiplying row 3 by negative 1 half. Next, we zero out the entries above your leading entries. We want to turn this into 0. We do that by replacing R2 with R2 plus 3R3 and replacing R1 with R1 plus R3. And lastly, we want to turn this 4 here above this leading entry. We want to turn this into 0. We do that by subtracting 4 R2 from R1. That will be your new R1.
Hence, we were able to get the identity matrix and this matrix over here on the right will now be your A inverse. Let us write A and A inverse as a product of elementary matrices. Write the elementary matrices corresponding to this row operations here. Row 1 and row 2 swapped will be 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Let's call this 1. And then here, A2 is, we replaced R2 by R2 minus 2, R1. Perform that on the identity matrix. So that's negative 2, 1, 0. For E3, we replaced R3 by R3 minus R1. So I will have a negative 1 here. For E4, we just multiplied row 2 by negative 1. For E5, We replaced row 3 by row 3 plus R2. So row 3 plus R2. There you go. For E6, we replaced R3 by negative 1 half R3. We multiplied row 3 by negative 1 half. For E7, we replaced row 2 by row 2 plus 3 R3. I will have a 3 over here. For E8, we replaced row 1 with row 1 plus R3. So we get 1, 0, 1. And lastly, for E9, E9 is 1, negative 4, 0. We have that. A inverse is equal to, start with E1, E2, and so on up to E9. There you go. And A is just equal to, if you want to write it as a product of elementary matrices, you just get the inverse of this. So you get E1 inverse, E2 inverse, and so on up to E9 inverse. Another example, let's show that this matrix here is not invertible. So again, we will augment it with the identity matrix. I will turn these entries over here to 0 because my leading end here is already equal to 1. So we do that by subtracting 2 times R1 to row 2 and you replace that to row 2 and then adding row 1 and row 3 and that would be your new R3. Get 0, 4 minus 12 is negative 8, negative 1 minus 8 is negative 9, negative 2, 1, 0. Adding row 3 and row 1, we get 0, 8, 9, 1, 0, 1. Look at the second row and the third row. If you add row 3 with row 2, that will be your new 
row C. You will get 0, 0, 0, negative 1, 1, 1. Take note that you have here a row of zeros. So this means that this matrix here cannot be the identity matrix. So therefore, A cannot be reduced to the identity matrix and hence A is not invertible. We conclude this lesson by giving equivalent statements for a matrix to be invertible. So number one, A is invertible if and only if AX equals zero has only the trivial solution. Let us recall that if you have a homogeneous equation, then the only two possibilities are, first, it has only the trivial solution, and the other one is that it has infinitely many solutions. In this case, if A is invertible, the only solution would be the trivial solution. Or, x is equal to 0. Again, why is that? Because when you multiply A inverse on the left, you get that x is equal to 0. Next, AX equals B has exactly one solution for any n by 1 matrix B. We've already seen this statement. The reduced row echelon form of A is the identity matrix, and the matrix A is expressible as a product of elementary matrices. Let us determine whether the following has non-trivial solutions. For number 1 and 2, take note that the coefficient matrix is given by 2, 7, 1, 1, 4, negative 1, and 1, 3, 0. But as we have seen earlier in our example, this matrix here is invertible. Since the coefficient matrix is invertible, that means that for the homogeneous equation, this one, the solution is just the trivial solution. Or x, y, z, they must all be equal to 0. For number 2, 1 and 2 are just the same except for the constant over here. The previous theorem tells us that this matrix here has exactly one solution. It is only asking whether it has non-trivial solution. So we know that it has exactly one solution. So therefore, the answer here is yes, it has non-trivial solution. In particular, one solution only. But for number one, no. And for number three, let's look at the coefficient matrix. It's equal to this one. And we've seen earlier, this is our example where we have seen that this one here is non-invertible or singular. And this is a homogeneous equation because of the zeros over here. So therefore, it cannot happen that it has only the trivial solution. So therefore, this has infinitely many solutions, non-trivial Solution. The answer here is also equal to yes. In our next lesson, we are going to discuss determinants and we will see that determinants can be used to find the inverse of a matrix.